Warhammer 40k is a franchise that explores a wide array of deep and often thought-provoking themes, from the tragedy that can unfold when man becomes consumed by his own hubris, the fine line between religion and fanaticism, the perils of technological stagnation, I mean, the list just goes on and on. However, amongst all of these themes, one stands apart from the rest as a concept that is woven into the very DNA of 40k itself, the grim brutality of war. You gotta remember, this is a pretty grim and bleak future. It's a universe where people die in their millions every single day, where the stars themselves are stained red with blood and entire worlds are drowned in figurative and sometimes literal oceans of gore. And none better represent the true carnage of the 41st millennium than Korn, the chaos god of blood and skulls, an entity of incalculable power that demands his followers spill blood and take skulls in his name. But who exactly is Korn and what is he all about? What are the beliefs and philosophies of Korn's blood cults? And who are these madmen that willingly choose to forsake their vows to the God Emperor and walk the Eightfold Path? In this video, we're going to get into all that and a whole lot more as we dive into the deeper philosophy of the Blood God and his followers. But before we dive headfirst into the Grimdark, I gotta tell you all about this video's sponsor, as Korn is finally coming to Warhammer Tacticus. If you somehow haven't heard of it yet, Tacticus is the definitive tactile mobile game for fans of Warhammer 40,000. And there's never been a better time to start playing, as the fearsome and brutal Chaos Space Marines of the World Eaters Legion have finally been added to the game. These guys are nearly inhuman monsters that have forsaken the Imperium and sworn themselves to the service of Korn, the god of blood and skulls. Right now, you can play as the World Eaters Terminator champion, Rask, and this guy is as powerful as he is bloodthirsty. He does a little bit of everything, not only is he strong in melee and at range, but he's equipped with a suit of ancient Terminator armor that allows him to deep strike and turns him into a walking tank. Whenever he shows up via deep strike or kills an enemy in melee, him and all of his allies in the area gain a temporary shield. When unleashed, his active ability Blood Fury decimates a single target, scoring additional hits for every time he's attacked. If he kills his target, all those additional hits spill over to additional nearby enemies in an explosion of damage. Tacticus's matches are fast-paced and brutal, and its core systems are intuitively designed to be simple to pick up and play, but difficult to master. If you know me, you know that I'm a massive Warhammer nerd, and I'm a sucker for seeing all of these characters that I love rendered in-game. And Tacticus has over 60 legendary iconic Warhammer champions with a whopping 15 playable factions, with new content being added all of the time. From multiple full-length faction-specific campaigns to PvP arenas, guild raids, salvage runs, and so much more. So what are you waiting for? Download Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus for free today by using my link in the description below. Big thanks to Tacticus for sponsoring this video. Deep within the hellish dimension known as the Realm of Chaos resides four dark gods of incalculable power. Zinch, the god of sorcery, Slanesh, the god of excess, Nurgle, the god of plagues, and Korn, the god of blood. Each of these gods is emotion-given sentience, formed from the collective beliefs of all conscious creatures that have ever or will ever exist within the physical universe. To worship one or all of the primordial four is to embrace chaos as the truth of reality. It is to reject the law and order of the Imperium and the will of the God Emperor of mankind, an action of the highest blasphemy and a decision that there is no coming back from. Yet, despite the dark and insidious nature of chaos, it continues to seduce more and more of the Emperor's flock, luring them with honeyed promises down a dark and twisting path of damnation. Each of the gods offers their followers something that the others cannot, each appealing to a different type of person. In this series, we're going to be taking a look at the beliefs and philosophies of each of the chaos gods and the cults that worship them. We're going to attempt to better understand what they're all about, who their followers really are, and why somebody would willingly choose to worship such malign entities. And we're going to kick this whole thing off with the most heavy metal of all of the Chaos Gods, the Lord of Blood and Skulls himself, Korn. Korn is the Chaos God of war, bloodshed, anger, and rage, the literal embodiment of hatred and violence-given sentience. Although the human mind is not capable of comprehending the true form of such an entity, he is often depicted as a gargantuan humanoid figure with a canine face that wields a titanic reality-sundering sword or axe depending upon the source you're looking at. The portion of the Realm of Chaos that he controls is known as the Realm of Brass and Blood, a twisted, ever-changing hellscape of blood-soaked battlefields where storms comprised of rage itself rip across crimson skies and batter the blood-drenched earth in explosions of raw destruction. 
Violent earthquakes send gouts of molten brass and boiling blood cascading into the sky, and the land is crisscrossed by rivers of gore. The air here is thick with the sounds of constant warfare, the screams of the damned and the bellowing, hooting war cries of blood-starved demons. It is a realm of constant, never-ending battle, where countless armies clash in a swirling melee of hatred and violence. In this lawless dimension, cowardice is viewed as the ultimate blasphemy. Only the strong have any hope of survival, while the weak are ruthlessly culled. At the very heart of this landscape can be found an enormous mountain of skulls, taken from both Korn's enemies and his slain followers. At the very top, seated upon a throne of brass, the Lord of Skulls rules over his realm and bears witness to every act of murder committed across space and time. Whereas all of the other Chaos Gods indulge in endless schemes, weaving ever more complex tapestries of lies and labyrinthian plots so complex that the human mind cannot even fathom their most basic of elements, Korn stands apart from the rest as the most straightforward in his desires. He cares only for endless battle and demands simply that those who seek to gain his favor spill blood and take skulls in his name. Across the galaxy, Korn has been worshipped by a wide array of different cultures and societies from feral and cannibalistic tribes on backwater worlds all the way up to the ranks of the Chaos Space Marines themselves, and notably with, but not limited to, the members of the World Eaters Legion. It is the collective belief of all those who follow him that through the act of killing, they in turn gain a portion of his favor and are rewarded with unparalleled martial prowess, infinite wells of physical strength, and the fury to overcome any foe. As these cultures commonly perceive him as the god of war, Korn is often depicted with the symbolism of battle, such as skulls, axes, and armor painted in arterial red. It should come as no surprise that he is most known for his bloodlust, as is seen in the common idiom, Korn cares not from whence the blood flows, only that it flows. But he also embodies a twisted form of honor. For a skull to be worthy of the skull throne, it must be taken in battle without trickery or cowardice. This is the main reason why his followers almost exclusively fight in melee. Discarding the use of ranged weaponry, with the exception of close-range firearms such as pistols, shotguns, and their demonic relic equivalents. For a kill to be worthy of corn, it must be done face to face, wherein you look your opponent directly in the eye and measure your ability against theirs. It is brutal, primal, and honest. In such a deathmatch, the more powerful combatant will have earned their right to live another day and go on to spill more blood, whereas the weaker fighter will have been honored by having met their end in combat at the hands of a worthy adversary. There is no honor in slaying your opponent from halfway across the map or utilizing deception or sorcery to give yourself an advantage. These are the tools of a coward, an equalizer utilized by the weak, individuals that Korn has a deep loathing of. Korn and his followers stand in direct contrast to all of the other gods, where his Zinch teaches his followers that through manipulation, treachery, and sorcery, they can take control of their own destiny. Korn's path is far more simple, to take what you want by force, to grab fate itself by the throat and shake the life from it. Nurgle teaches his followers to embrace despair, that the one true truth of the universe is decay and entropy. Thus, one should accept their position in the Great Circle. The followers of the Blood God reject the shackles of such an existence, breaking free of the universe's cyclical nature to instead carve their own bloody path in whatever direction they choose. Now, don't get me wrong, Korn has no love for any of his siblings, but by far the one he and his followers despise the most is Slanesh, the god of excess. The only form of excess Korn tolerates is the spilling of blood and taking of skulls, but the followers of the Prince of Pleasure indulge in excess in all of its forms. To Slanesh, battle is simply another pleasure to indulge in. The splitting of a skull or the feeling of an enemy's blood dripping from your own fingers is nothing more than a momentary thrill. It is their belief that for a kill to have any meaning behind it, it must be drawn out as long as possible. The victim must be made to suffer, to be humiliated and tortured in the most grotesque ways imaginable. It is not the kill itself that they value, but the misery that precedes it. Such an ideology is anathema to Korn. It is said that his infinite rage for the child god is barely kept in check, and if ever there was a time to come where the Lord of Blood would risk condemning all of existence to oblivion by raising his sword to kill one of his siblings, it would almost certainly be Slanesh whose skull he takes. 
The corruption spread by the ruinous powers can manifest in a lot of different ways, and although Korn's siblings are no stranger to violence, it is not their preferred method of spreading their influence. Slaanesh may corrupt a planetary governor, pushing him down the path of excess until he turns the entire planet into a hedonistic death cult. Nurgle spreads ever more virulent plagues that not only infect a single planet, but all those its inhabitants will end up traveling to, spreading his influence and corruption through the path of infection. And Zinch? He lures his followers in with promises of unearned power through sorcery and forbidden knowledge. Now, it is said that every mortal that has ever lived has at some point been unknowingly part of one of his ludicrously complex plots, as each are millennia in the making and are comprised of a labyrinthian array of overlapping schemes with infinite variables. The tiniest glimpse of his truth could drive the unprepared mind into irreparable madness. Korn, on the other hand, throws all of that out the window. He despises liars and secret keepers and has no taste for subtlety. Though landscape and circumstance of the battle may change, his desires are always the same. Give in to your rage and take skulls. Nothing pleases him more than the free flowing of blood. It is where he draws his power from and aids in the spreading of his influence. Although Korn appreciates every act of murder, his singular acts of violence are not enough to sustain his endless hunger for slaughter. Korn demands constant, merciless warfare, slaughter on a planetary scale, and the extinction of entire species. To a Kornate cultist, there is nothing more direct and honest than anger and violence. It is through embracing rage, the most primal and honest of emotions, that any action is justified and any problem or obstacle immediately neutralized. They view the all-consuming brutality of war as the true state of reality. Thus, they dedicate the entirety of their existence, mind, body, and soul, to the simple goal of fueling endless conflict. If one of his followers displeases the blood god by failing to provide sufficient blood sacrifices, and not only will they fail to gain his blessing, but it is likely that they will find themselves in the next offering. Their blood drunk, soul consumed, and their worthless bones thrown without reverence into the wastes that surround the skull throne. If through their contribution, their patron emerges triumphant in the great game, managing to both dominate his siblings and destroy the anathema, the god emperor of mankind, then the galaxy will be twisted into a perpetual battlefield. One where the stars are stained red in the blood of untold billions, and every man, woman, and child across every planet from the galaxy's core to the galactic rim will bellow out in unison a war cry as iconic as it is direct in its meaning. Blood for the blood god, skulls for the skull throne. To stand against Korn is an act of futility. It would be like trying to fight against the idea of gravity, as he is as much a sentient entity as he is a concept. Not only does the act of fighting against him in turn make him stronger, but he is also eternal. He has existed since the first sentient creature picked up a rock and murdered their brother in cold blood. Since predatory beasts have hunted prey and planets have been consumed by the death spasms of stars. Until such a time comes that the galaxy is somehow impossibly purged of anger, hatred, and violence, and all sentient species willingly choose to live in a state of apathy, Corn will continue to exist. For there is no peace amongst the stars, only an eternity of slaughter and the laughter of thirsting gods. So now that we know a bit more about who the Blood God is and what he's all about, let's take a minute to talk about the heretics that worship him. Although Korn can influence and corrupt just about every sentient species so long as they have the ability to feel anger, the vast majority of the lore surrounding his mortal followers mainly focuses on the human perspective. Now, way back in the day, we had Chaos Orcs, Chaos Eldar, and even in the Fire Warrior novel, which is an adaptation of the video game by the same name, we got to see a Tau Fire Warrior fall to Korn. But since more modern lore has mostly moved away from this, we're going to keep things simple by focusing on Korn's human followers. That being said, most of the things that we're going to cover could still apply to these other species as well. Servants of the Blood God are individuals who have gained enlightenment through Korn's teaching, having developed a deep loathing for the Imperium, its culture, and traditions. They believe that for over 10,000 years, the Imperium subjects have been fed near constant lies designed to shield them from the true nature of the universe. Ironically, in their desperation to protect mankind from the Eightfold Path, the leaders of the Imperium have locked the species in a cycle of perpetual ignorance, each and every one of them left constantly thrashing amidst a sea of dogmatic corruption, without aim or purpose. 
In this way, humanity has been reduced to nothing more than a parasite, a wretch that is dependent upon their masters for all of their needs, be it food, water, breathable air, or shelter. The Imperium tells them what to do, what to think, who to pray to, and even how to die. By rejecting the Imperium's teachings and embracing corn, an individual is given the strength they need to break free of their mental, physical, and spiritual shackles, in turn becoming a symbol of strength and determination to all those around them. Through corn, these people have been able to take back the precious virtue of self-reliance that the corpse emperor and his servants had stolen from them. From the Cornate cult's perspective, violence is not just something to venerate, but is essential for the continued existence of the human race. War, ambition, disease, and the lust for power inherent in all sentient species will always find a way to put different societies, nations, and empires into conflict with one another. Since time began, it has been a fundamental law of existence that the strong live while the weak perish, that stronger nations topple weaker ones. Thus, strength is essential to our survival, and the pursuit of power is the base-driving instinct that has directed our evolutionary path ever since we first crawled out of the primordial ooze. Every sentient species that has ever or will ever exist wages war upon their rivals, even the ignorant that claim to have become enlightened. Those who claim the pursuit of unity and peace as their ultimate goal will not willingly submit to the cause of another's greater good. When these people's creeds are tested, when their morals are found wanting, they will take up arms against their enemies, shedding their peaceful facade and embracing their inherently violent nature. In such examples, one of these soldiers could view their armed service as a duty performed for a higher cause, violence done in the name of peace. But when it comes to those who have dedicated themselves to corn, there is no greater purpose to violence than the violence itself. The ignorant view peace as the natural state of reality, with war existing as an unfortunate necessity to maintain the peaceful status quo. But with the followers of corn, this idea is inversed. Peacetimes only exist to reforge lost weapons and armor, to regroup and mount another assault or plan a new invasion, a momentary unnatural lull in an inherently violent galaxy. Although how one first begins to hear the whispers of corn does vary from person to person, in almost all cases, it begins with a sudden and explosive storm of violence. Perhaps they lashed out in rage at a perceived threat or somebody that stood in their way. And maybe it was simply a barroom brawl that got out of hand, or maybe they were simply protecting their home from an intruder. Every single time an individual spills blood or gives in to rage, there is a chance that Korn will notice them. And if in this individual he sees potential, he will offer them the power they desire. When lost in rage, few would deny the blood god's offer. Their muscles bulge, adrenaline floods throughout their body, and they lose themselves to their bloodlust, their mind becoming saturated with the desire to spill more blood and take the skulls of all those who wronged them. Much like how their patron deity has no tolerance for grand schemes and subtle manipulation, so too do the blood cults believe that there is no goal that cannot be achieved through direct and bloody action. With an unflinching will and enough bloodshed, any foe can be overcome and any problem solved. When it comes to the esteemed Chaos Warbands, the worship and admiration of corn is done openly and with pride, whereas with smaller blood cults, their rituals are done in secret, whether in shadowy back rooms or in the tunnels beneath crowded streets. It is in these dark places that they plot new raids and murders. And given the terrible state of most Imperial worlds, most of the time the average civilian isn't going to notice an increase in violent crime or missing persons. A single individual may be momentarily disturbed when they stumble across the gory remains left behind by a cult, but the local Arbides will often dismiss their concerns. Deep within a hive city, death hides around every corner, so many of these cults are able to continue operating in secret for decades or sometimes even centuries without tripping any alarms. Much like how everybody's introduction to corn is different, so too are the circumstances in which an individual comes to join a blood cult. Maybe they do it simply because they're tired of living under the Imperium's thumb. And maybe they've grown disillusioned with the God Emperor that seemingly has forgotten them in their struggle. Maybe they want to take vengeance on somebody who hurt them in the past, or as is often the case, they might just have some psychopathic tendencies and truly enjoy the feeling of shattering jawbones with their own fists. To individuals that are predisposed to violence, vengeance and combat become something like an addiction. They're compelled to constantly seek out new highs by fighting and killing ever more powerful foes. 
And you may be wondering why these cultists who are obsessed with violence and murder don't end up turning on one another. And the reality is that that can happen. But often, these outcasts find brotherhood amongst the other psychopaths they are in league with. All of these people are bound together by the common desire to kill and offer blood and skulls in exchange for both power and retribution. They may be crazy, but they're not stupid. They realize the basic math that although a single man lost to rage may be able to kill a handful of people before meeting his demise, a small group working together could double or triple their individual ties of blood. And when an entire cult or warband goes to war, they can bring entire hive cities to their knees or topple an entire planet. In this way, in the dark corners of cities across the galaxy, Korn's blood craze flock continues to grow. Okay, so now we know all about Korn and his followers, including their philosophy, what they believe, what they want, and now I kind of want to throw a little bit of a curveball here and examine what anger and rage actually are to better understand why somebody would choose to follow Korn. It's one thing to just say that it's because they get more powerful and they want power, but what is it specifically about the emotion of anger itself that acts as a gateway for Korn's influence? Well, anger is one of the oldest and most primal of emotions and is designed to protect us against perceived threats. It is part of our fight or flight response and helps us process danger. It gives us a sense of safety and control over things that are outside of our hands. Not only is it normal to experience anger, but in all honesty, it's an evolutionary advantage. Rage, on the other hand, is an escalation of anger derived from continuous threats, be they physical, mental, or spiritual. When enraged, our body dumps a cascade of endocrine pathways that respond to specific negative feedback loops, involving our hypothalamus, anterior pituitary gland, and the adrenal gland. It is in these moments that the prefrontal cortex, the area of our brain responsible for critical thought, completely shuts off. Rage is all-consuming and narrows our focus unlike anything else. So you've got a bit of a double whammy here. On one hand, the feeling of safety and protection that anger gives us feels good. It feels good to take back control. Now, on the other hand, the physical feeling of an adrenaline rush is something that our body perceives as pleasurable. Additionally, for many corn worshippers, they may feel a sense of catharsis when enraged, as the inability to think critically, the simplification of their desires and the present moment becoming all that matters, may offer an addictive form of escapism from the trials and tribulations of an uncaring galaxy. Because we in the real world receive mental and physical rewards when we experience anger, and in the case of the Corne cultists also experiencing spiritual rewards as well, anger can quite literally be addictive. Which is ironic that this addiction to anger is what Korn feeds on, and it's how he worms his way into the minds of his cultists, because we commonly associate addiction as part of Slaanesh's territory. Also, a couple fun facts, as I kind of went down the psychology of rage rabbit hole while doing research for this video, that people who experience chronic pain are more prone to rage, as every time they get a twinge of pain, their brain interprets it as a threat. Likewise, people who experience early childhood trauma can end up in a state where they're subconsciously constantly scanning for threats, making them also prone to anger issues later in life. And this fits the World Eaters Legion to a T. Now, this isn't necessarily a video about their lore, they'll get their own deep dive later on, but if you know anything about the 12th Legion, you know that they're in constant pain because of the butcher's nails implanted in their brain, and they had an incredibly abusive, tumultuous, and painful relationship with their father figure and Primarch Angron, possibly the most brutally abusive dad that ever lived. Anger is something that humanity will never be rid of. It is a core emotion and an integral part of the human experience. So long as anger continues to exist, so long as the galaxy is plagued by violence and endless war, corn will remain eternal, spurring humanity onward to ever more grotesque and bombastic acts of bloodshed and slaughter, his blood cults multiplying by the day and his influence and power continuing to grow. But what do you think of all this? Who's your favorite chaos god and why? If you had to choose to follow one of them, which one would it be? I'll freely admit here that even though Nurgle is my favorite of the gods, I've got a whole Death Guard and Nurgle Demon army that I love playing with, if I was actually forced to live in the 40k universe and follow one of these dudes, I gotta say being a worshipper of the Blood God would probably be a lot more fun. It would certainly be a lot less stinky. 
What do you think of the beliefs of Korn's followers? Do they make sense to you or do you think they're kind of ridiculous? What's your favorite or least favorite thing about Korn? Let me know all of your thoughts, comments, questions, and especially corrections down in the comment section below. As although I try to put as much research into my videos as I can, I haven't read everything and y'all quite frequently blow me away with your insight and unique perspectives on 40k. Also, I don't normally ask y'all to do this, but if you could leave a like on this video, subscribe to the channel if you aren't already, maybe ring the bell or just say hi in the comment section, all of that helps me out a lot and I would really appreciate it. Also, let me know if you want me to do one of these types of videos for the other three gods as well. If this video does well, I'll definitely make a few follow-ups. Okay, with all that said, big thanks to everybody who supports the work that I do and I'll catch y'all in the next one.